All right, so this is Robert Heath. This is um, lecture number 11 of the Wireless Communications Lab. So today uh, we're going to transition into a new chapter, which is on um, dealing with uh, impairments that are found in the communication channel. And so we're going to start off with talking about uh, so what is generally known as symbol synchronization or timing recovery. And what you should be able to do is formulate the discrete time symbol synchronization problem and then solve that problem using maximum output energy maximization. And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about frame synchronization. And so you should be able to formulate the frame synchronization problem and solve it using the energy detector, or probably we'll just do the correlator. And this is both for frequency flat channels. And then finally, we're going to conclude with a discussion of this mathematical technique known as least squares. And so this um, will help us formulate and solve some more complicated uh, timing and synchronization and estimation problems, which we'll use this in the lecture on Wednesday. So that is the plan here. So let's start off first with uh, some a little bit of background here. On, let's see. So a little bit of background on synchronization. In flat channels here. So thus far we've been looking at this communication system where we have these bits, symbol mapping, we have an up sampler, a digital pulse shaping filter, discrete to continuous converter, some transmit energy here, creating this X of T, and then we had over here, this is on the transmit side. And then on the receive side, we've got this observed signal Y of T coming in to a continuous to discrete converter operating again at a fraction of the symbol rate, a digital match filter, downsampling by M, the symbol detector, the inverse symbol mapper, and producing our best guess of the bits that were sent here. So this is like the, the block diagram that we've built up over the last um, maybe two weeks of lectures or so. And then we talked successively about, you know, constellations and the symbol mapping. We talked about um, you know how to do the what what is the right design for transmit pulse shaping filter? What's the right design for the receive pulse shaping filter? How do we perform the detection? How do we perform the inverse symbol mapping? So that's what we essentially have done so far. And our canonical communication channel that we considered was that the complex baseband receive signal Y of T is equal to the complex baseband transmitted signal X of T plus noise. And this is the additive white Gaussian noise channel. So this is a very common channel. It's analyzed in um, digital communication and, and widely used in information theory. Now, unfortunately, um, th this, this may be a very good model in certain cases, wireline communication cases. But this communication model neglects many actual impairments that can happen in any communication system, but especially in wireless systems. And so what we're going to look at in the next couple lectures is a very slight generalization of this to the following here, where we have a system, and you can think about this as being a, um, you know, linear time invariant system here, such that We're still going to have noise, but we're going to receive a shifted, possibly scaled version of the transmitted signal. 
again, plus noise here. <coughs> and so you can see that, you know, what's in this box here is essentially alpha e to the j theta delta of t minus tau. Now, you could also write that in its equivalent band-limited form, which by convolving it with a sink, which I'm not doing here. Now, why this is important, so let's think of, for a minute here what such channel represents. I mean, effectively, this represents a delay between the signal, between the transmitter and receiver, and an attenuation and possibly a complex phase shift. All that's pretty benign, and you would pretty much expect it, right? Because, you know, we, we have yet to figure out how to instantaneously communicate between two points. So at a minimum, there's going to be propagation delay. Um, and the, the, there could be, you know, delay just because of the distance between the transmitter and receiver. There could also be delays because the signal is reflected off of a long path. And so it, it's essentially a function of propagation time. The attenuation is, as we've already discussed a bit, and we'll discuss more in around lecture 20, you know, as the signal's propagating it, the wave front expands and you receive a smaller and smaller fraction of the energy here. So that's why there's an alpha here. And then because we're considering this complex baseband model, remember when you go from the, um, from the channel to the complex baseband equivalent, there's a complex phase that shows up as a function of the frequency and the delay. So that's essentially what the, the complex theta is here. Now, more generally, the, we're just going to take this to be, you know, some sort of a complex number here, which we'll call H, and then this would just be like a delay here. And so today, we're going to consider, um, really, we're going to focus on the tau here which is the delay. And so in the, in the Wednesday's lecture, we'll talk about the channel, and then we'll talk a little bit more generally about more, even more complicated input-output relationships here. So today, so we're going to focus on tau here. And so let me go to another page here. And so let's think for a second here. Let me find this here. Hello. There we go. No. All right. It's an adaptive system. We have to train it. All right. There we go. Okay. So now we're going we're to look at two possible values for tau. And so essentially, tau, this delay, we can always write as some integer multiple of the symbol period plus some fraction, let's call tau sub d here. So this is symbol period. This is an integer. And this is some number that's a fraction of tau here. And so the problem of um, estimating the k here, so k is going to lead to what's called um, a frame offset. And so estimating the K and correcting for it is going to be known as frame synchronization. abbreviate as frame sync here. And tau sub d, so, so the, the k here is essentially is frame offset. So if you had only frame offset, your input-output relationship in discrete time would look something like this here. If you only had frame offsets, you can go back through, substitute this in. All you end up with is the symbols start arriving at a later point than you expected. That's, that's it. But yet, if you want to decode that symbol stream correctly, you need to know where it starts. You know, we have to know when the lecture begins, and we have to know essentially where, where the meaningful information starts to be sent here. Now, the second point here is tau sub d. This is known as um, symbol timing offset. And then correcting for this is um, 
roughly known as symbol synchronization. And so we'll look at this symbol synchronization today, but this one is a little bit more tricky because if you remember, all the derivations that we did with the um, de in deriving the, the form for the transmit and receive pulse shaping filter all assumed that we sampled at exactly the right point. And that was a very special waveform because we sampled exactly at the appropriate instant. If we don't sample the right spot, we're left with residual inter symbol interference. And so if you don't do simple synchronization in this very simple channel, all the symbols get added up together. And so we'll, we'll see that essentially right now. Okay, so now let's focus on symbol synchronization here. So consider the signal, what is that? Oh, this is an I, believe it or not. Signal after the match filter. And we're supposed that tau sub d is somewhere in the range of zero to t here. So I should really be correct here and put a parenthesis there. So if that's the case here, so if you remember the formula for y of n here, so remember that y of n is going to be square root of vx here. I'm going to put in my h, that's my channel coefficients, alpha e to the j theta, sum over m, s of m, g of, now here we've got n minus m, of t, oh, minus tau sub d here. Plus v of n. So the only things that are new here, so we're multiplying everything by the h, and then we also have a delay by, by tau sub d here. And this makes sense because we're you know, essentially just convolving this quantity here with a delta of t minus tau sub d, so we bring the tau inside the, the g here. Now, if we expand this out, we want to, supposing that we want to still use the same detector that we've been using so far, we're going to get um, square root of ex h times s of n here. Remember that g0 is 1, so plus sum over m not equal to n, s of m, g of n minus m, t, sorry, I forgot the, I have to put the g of tau over here. Uh, and so what we end up with here is, um, this right here is the inner symbol interference. And then this term here is multiplied by this g of tau of d, which is um, typically less than 1 here. So this is resulting in signal degradation, too. So by not sampling at the right point. So if you remember what, like what the sync function looks like, for example, right? It's always rolling off like this here. I suppose this is true for all pulse shapes here, but, um, but certainly the point of G0 is equal to 1. And then, as and in this case here for sync and raised cosine, as you go away from 1, this gets smaller here. And then we still end up with noise, because, you know, it doesn't matter where you start sampling the noise, the noise is, the noise is still there here. So the symbol synchronization problem is is about um, effectively estimating this tau and correcting for it. And there's several different ways that you can do this here. So this could actually be done in analog. It could be done in a high rate of analog and digital, and it can be done in, in digital. So we're going to focus on the digital case here. So effectively, what we're going to do is um, we're going to focus on the case where we have the signal coming in to the CTD being sampled at some fraction of the symbol rate. And then we're going to have some 
some digital synchronization block that will estimate this parameter, tau sub d, and it will have a digital correction block. So this is sort of the, the model that we're looking at here. Now again, I mean, you, it, it might be possible to do this in analog, and, and in, for many, many years, such functions were performed in analog, and then you would do that over here in front of the CTD here. But based on you know, what we've been trying to do in the whole class is we're trying to push as much as possible into the digital domain. So we don't want to have to do any of this analog filtering, any of these other more complicated feedback loops in analog. We want to do it all in digital here. Okay, so now let's look at um, the specific structure that we're going to assume here. Any, any questions just about the problem, first of all? Like why we have this problem or... Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, so effectively what we're going to do is... Um, we are going to approach this problem using oversampling. And so essentially the idea is going to be that um, what we're going to do is we're going to At our C to D here, we're going to sample. So already we were sampling at potentially greater than the Nyquist rate here. But now we're potentially going to sample at much greater than the Nyquist rate. We still have our digital pulse shaping filter here. But instead of downsampling, what we're going to do is we're going to delay that signal by some little m here, and then downsample it. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take that received signal, we're going to oversample it here, and then we're going to try to approximate Find the, find the one sample that approximates the corresponding symbol timing delay, and then we delay the inputs by that amount. So that's, that's pretty much it here. So we're not estimating tau sub d directly, right? Because actually, we don't really care about tau sub d. Really what we want to do is we want the output here to be as intersymbol inter inter interference free as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to formulate a problem as a function of all possible offsets of m, trying to find the one that's the best. And you should be able to see here that because we're downsampling by m, that there's only m possible values of that little m here, right? So if we oversample by a factor of 100, there's only 100 ways you can shift that input symbol sequence before you hit the next symbol. And if you're hitting the next symbol, that's the frame synchronization problem. So there's only 100, you know, m total possible offsets. <clears throat> okay, so to get some insight into the structure here, um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a particular approach based on, um, we're going to actually start with a continuous time signal and then try to discretize it, discretize it in an interesting way. And I want to go through this derivation because what this shows is that um, discretizing directly isn't necessarily the best thing to do. So hopefully you'll see that here. So we're going to <coughs> solve. Um, so the best thing would be to do something like maximum likelihood. I mean, there's, there's formal estimation procedures that we could take to determine the tau or the, the value of m. So we're not going to do that here. So instead, we're going to formulate a different optimization objective. So we're going to look at what's called the output energy maximization. <clears throat> and 
And so again, we're going to start off with continuous time, then we're going to go back into discrete time here. So the output energy maximization problem is something like this follows here. So we're going to formulate this optimization using this J. J is like our optimization function. And I'm going to make this J a function of tau here. <coughs> and for the output energy, so we're going to consider what is the average value of the received signal sampled at y of nt plus some tau here. <coughs> Actually, we could put a we could put a minus in here too. Uh, it doesn't change any of the derivation, but it, it somehow makes the delay perhaps seem more more intuitive here. But I have I have everything on my notes with the plus, and so I'm going to use the plus just to avoid any typos in the lecture notes here. So effectively, what we're doing here is we're supposing okay. So so I take the the received signal y, and I shift it by some tau here, and this is the received signal that's been delayed. Here, so this is this is. Let me emphasize here. So this is this received signal after matched filtering in continuous time, and this tau here is not tau sub d. This is just a variable. that we're going to try to optimize over here. And so then the maximum output energy maximization problem is essentially we're going to maximize J of tau over possible values of tau, which should be within a symbol period here to be unique. And so the tau solution is tau hat d is the arg max of this right here, which is the arg max of the expectation of y of nt plus tau magnitude squared here. Now the motivation for this comes from, you know, if, if you look at Let's take this uh, expectation here. So if I take the expectation of y of nt plus tau, I get the expectation of sum over m. Sorry, this is dx sum over m. G of m t plus tau minus tau sub d magnitude squared plus sigma v squared, which should be less than or equal to e x times g zero squared plus noise here. So essentially, the, the observation is that, at least for the, the pole shapes that we've considered so far, that if you sum the sampled pole shape, it has the maximum value when you sample it at exactly the right point. So that's, that's essentially the motivation here. Now, how we actually solve it is um, what we're going to do is we're going to first differentiate this original cost function here. So we're going to differentiate with respect to tau j of tau here. And because we have an expectation, so that we're differentiating an expected value of something. Expectation is, is an integral. Um, we're going to assume that things are well-behaved so that we can exchange the order of integration and expectation, uh, which, you know, if you take like real analysis class, you realize is not something we can always do, but in this case, it's okay. And we're going to approximate this derivative as the expected value of the derivative with respect to y of nt plus tau here. Now we need a little bit of um, background on complex analysis here, but essentially when you're differentiating absolute value squared, the thing you do is you break it into the um, 
complex number times its conjugate, and then you use the product rule. And so this is equal to expected value of, so let's see, y of nt plus tau times the derivative with respect to tau of y conjugate nt plus tau. And then linearity of expectation lets us write expectation of y conjugate nt plus tau derivative with respect to tau y of nt plus tau here. Okay, so we just apply that sum rule here and because this thing tau we're differentiating is real. We can rewrite this as 2 times the real part of the expectation of, um, actually, is that the reason? No, I think so. All right. Y of nt plus tau, derivative of y conjugate, nt plus tau here. So effectively what we're doing is this right here is we're looking at the change in y with respect to the tau here. And then we're looking at the average of the product of the signal y and a slight change in y. Now the problem is here is that we don't have any expectation, right? There's no expectation in LabVIEW, last I checked. So what would you use instead of expectation? in the lab? Sum or mean sample average. Essentially, right, we assume that there's um, some ergodicity so that if we take a sample average, it'll approach the ergodic average or the expectation. So that's what we'll do here. So first, we'll suppose that, um, so we're going to replace expectation by sample average. So let's write this d, d tau, y star, nt plus capital tau here. Sorry, I'm checking the, uh, what am I doing here? Expectation. Sorry. Yeah, so what I want to do is I want to replace this quantity here. So I'm now, so then, then I'm going to approximate this value here with the real 2 times the real part of 1 over p sum from n equals 0 to p minus 1 of y of nt plus tau d d tau y star nt plus tau here, where we're assuming that we have p values. We're, we're essentially going to average over p symbol periods. Here. So we've gotten rid of the expectation, and now we can also move the real inside here. And then, you know, because we're doing an arg max, it actually, we can get rid of the, the constants arbitrarily here. So now what we're going to do is, um, because we don't have the y in the lab, because y is the output after the ideal analog match filter, and all we have is the sampled version. So now we're going to discretize at this point here. But, um, you know, how can we discretize the derivative of y? Because we don't have the derivative of y either, because we don't have y. Well, we're going to use uh, the finite difference. And so that's, that's the trick that we use right now. So now we're going to assume this is oversampling. And I'm going to write a new cost function here. I'm going to call it j of k, and I'm going to sum, so I'm going to get rid of the p and the 2, I don't care about those, I'm going to sum here, still over p symbol periods, but now that I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to oversample here, so I'm going to, instead of having um, 
y continuous time of nt, I'm assuming that y of t goes into a c to d being sampled at t over m, producing at the output, let's call it r of n here. So I'm going to get r for a second here, R in, yeah, the way I've done this here should be N, M, plus K. So this right here corresponds to taking every um, symbol period of Y. So there's M samples in every symbol period. So that's why I have a capital M here. So this is NM plus K. K is going to substitute for my tau. And then I'm going to replace this derivative here with the difference R star of NM plus K. I'm going to say plus some little delta here. Minus R star NM plus K minus little delta here. And so typically for this little delta, you can just take one. Here. And so then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to solve for the K such that, and actually I should call this something else here. Let me call this, I don't know, we call it J sub O here. So now I've gone from doing this maximization. So here what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find stationary points. I want to set this to zero. So this is actually is going to be now a minimum here. So I'm going to take the arg min, oops, sorry, I forgot the real here, of searching over values of k from zero to m minus one. I can put the real on the inside here. Looking at the average, of the real of R of N M plus K, R star N M plus K plus one minus R star N M plus K minus one here. And I search for all the possible values here of K and I find the one that corresponds to this being very small and that's the one that I take as my sample offset here. And then using this notation here, you can think that tau sub d hat is essentially this k hat times t over capital M here. So that's essentially it. Um, now, really, let me go back and update my picture here slightly because now I've changed the notation slightly here. So I'm going to put this with a K here. I'm going to put a plus here just to correspond with the fact that I have a plus here. Sorry. And then there's the K there. Okay. So effectively, what we're doing here is we're going to take our oversampled match filtered signal. We're going to run this optimization problem right here. And what that's going to spit out is a little k hat. And that little k hat is how we delay our input signal. And then we downsample it. That's, that's essentially the idea here. And then the final thing I want to mention is that this whole idea of, of oversampling depends somehow on the hardware. You know, having a lot of, like a high sampling rate of the hardware. But it actually doesn't have to. So what you could alternatively do is you could have a signal here. Let's not label that here. 
a continuous to discrete converter operating at, let's say, instead of T over M, let's call this T over M N O P Q. I haven't used Q yet. Let's say T over Q here. Still satisfying Nyquist. And then you can use what I call in the book a resampler here which will take you from Q to M samples. And then you can have exactly the same structure before. <clears throat> what a resampler does is it takes a discrete time signal that has been sampled at a rate, at or exceeding the Nyquist rate, and converts it into a, another signal that has been sampled at, over, effectively oversampled at a potentially higher rate. Actually, you can go lower too, but it still has to satisfy Nyquist here. And the reason you can do that is all the information in a band-limited signal is, is contained in its samples. So if you were to oversample it, you would just have some redundancy there. And so, in, in the book, you'll see that the form of this resampler is effectively, it's a combination of upsampling, filtering, and downsampling. That comes from um, 351M, but um, it's also repeated there in the book for interest. And there is um, usually some sort of a function. I don't remember what this function is in lab view, but I think there is a resampler function in there here. But it's essentially just a, a, um, a rate change filtering operation. So this you could use if, for example, your hardware only lets you oversample by a factor of four. But to get a good estimate of the symbol timing, you might have to oversample by a factor of 100. So you would use a 4 to 100 resampler to get a um, better timing estimate here. OK, so questions about the symbol timing here? I'm trying to see if there's anyone whose eyes are not glazed over. Oh, yeah, yes. How do you make the argument minimum? Like we started with the argument in the previous generation? Yeah, because I wanted to set the derivative equal to zero. So I'm basically going to. Yeah, I skipped that step here, but. Yeah, so I'm going to try to maximize it by setting the derivative to zero here. Yes. Right. It, it's it's um, it's essentially what is the politically correct way to put this? Is a hack that works. I mean, it, it's it's a. Um, th there are other probabilistic techniques that would be better. Maximum likelihood map. Um, but they typically lead to much more complicated solution for synchronization. So, so the resulting optimization that you have to solve is just harder. And so for the purposes of um, the class, we, we just end up using this, this simpler approach here. The other reason that I like this approach is that what we're going to see later is that when you have a more complicated propagation channel, the channel introduces intersymbol inter interference. And symbol synchronization becomes somewhat artificial. But by oversampling and taking the maximum output energy path, you can actually get better performance there. So this is somehow a solution that will be more robust when we have a more complicated channel. And there's really no proof for that other than just, you know, it seems to work well. So. Now, I, have you all, I assume have not done this in the lab yet, I hope. All right, that's good, because at some point, we're doing things that you've already done in the lab. Now, there's one simpler approach here. Does anyone see the simpler approach directly? I mean, the, the simpler approach here would just be to discretize so, and solve the following problem here. So let's do an argmax of you get rid of the p here, like before. p equals 0 to p minus 1. 
absolute value of y of, so this should be n here, n m plus k absolute value squared. I mean, if I just oversampled the signal, this would be the dis this would be the sampled um, maximum output energy. All right, so all I do is I just take the I just take the oversamples at sample k, add them all up, and square it. So this actually also works now. In theory, this, this, you know, this should lead, if you have enough samples, this should lead to actually a, a better solution. But um, often this is actually sufficient. So, you know, you can start with the discretizing here. Mathematically, why I wanted to show this approach was that um, if you try to differentiate directly the this, um, this quantity right here. Well, first of all, it wouldn't make sense because it's an integer. It's not a continuous variable here. And this solution is not this solution either. You know, so, some, so, so somehow trying to optimize the continuous valued function leads to a different, re and discretizing leads to a different result if you discretize first. So I don't know. I just find that very curious. And I think that's just something to remember because I suspect that there's other problems where Trying a continuous time first will lead to a better solution. So here, you know, in the lab, I, I don't remember if we implement both of them or not. You might implement both, but and you can compare them for yourselves. Um, I don't think we see much difference. They'd probably be this both work the same. All right. What am I missing here? Aside from two thirds of the lecture. Hmm. All right, let's take a short break here. Let's see. Let's see. All right, short break. Let's see. Yes, okay. So I was reading this. Uh, there, there's uh, several websites that give news about wireless. There's RCR Wireless, Wireless Week. This came off of one of those. I think it was Wireless Week here. And the article itself, not not super interesting here, but it, it's talking about Sprint pushing NFC is NFC is near field communication, not some sporting organization. <laughs> so it probably does. Does that mean something? Yes. National. Okay. Ah, yeah. There we go. Of course. Yes. Near field communication. <laughs> yeah, that might actually get some more interest here if this was National Football Conference and Sprint was pushing it here. Um, <laughs> so what this is is this this is a communication technique. Near field is is usually um, meant to have very short range and is is also usually communication in the near field. So typically magnetic loop instead of um, far field. Waves and the idea is this is like if you, any of you have these this little magnetic key fob you can pay with stuff. If your credit card instead of swiping a credit card, you like push this little thing on there. Does anyone have a credit card? No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a credit card that's not maxed out. Um, so so basically a way to let your you could use your phone and you could go somewhere and you could put your phone on the you know the payment device and then it would. Um, you know, somehow get the information about your credit card or PayPal account or whatever, and you could pay. Uh, and then, because it's near field, the idea is that someone who's at the other end of the room here can't steal my signal and thus steal my credit card information. That's the, that's the idea. So why I picked this up here is just that it seems like this technology, at least in the U.S., is not taking off at all. So. I don't. I don't know why. Does anyone actually use this or have any experience with this? Um, yeah. Like the new TID cards around campus, like there's like a scanner, and you just like place it next to the scanner, and so there's like a chip inside the card. Yeah. So it's, it's used around campus, but I haven't seen that used anywhere else. But do you get to charge stuff with it? 
Because I know we use it for entry to some of the buildings. Um, it's used for like the barrel system, so the printing system on campus is like it. They give you access, but I don't know if you can pay you just like hmm. uh, chip. Okay. Is anyone here like using that in another country? Because I thought it was popular. In my country, when you yeah. like on the MRT bus, yeah. taxi, and bicycles and the company is on. So everything is on there. Yeah. yeah. And also credit card. So why why is that then? Why do we not have? Hmm. <laughs> there was a yeah. I remember yeah. Um, last year hmm. was in a it was a. Comstock student branch. Yeah. Uh, there was a meeting actually about NFC, and there was a lot of security issues brought up. Interestingly, in my way, even though. Yeah. Yeah. Can you change the encryption over time, or is it stuck with the same encryption the entire time? I don't know. I don't know anything about how it works here. If it's stuck with the same encryption time, if you crack the encryption, like it's a bit busy city like New York, we go to the subway, you can sit there with the receiver in your pocket. Everyone walks by the, their phone when they brush up nice and tight. And actually, they were right there, right? And actually, in that meeting, that they actually yeah. uh, demonstrated um, essentially sort of hacking someone's uh, credit card with near view communication, with permission hmm. from the owner. Okay, yes, yeah, yes, so, of course. So, yeah, they, so they show that you can really hack it to, you know, buy a soda or something without the owner really knowing. Hmm. Let's see. Hmm. My favorite is the ISIS bill for that says, if you lose your phone, just give us a call, we'll lock your account. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if I lost my phone, I'm going to call you. Yeah, so don't lose your credit card. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, the one, the one comment they make in here just about the, the acceptance rate is that the, the iPhone doesn't support it, so. They're trying to push their, their own proprietary thing, which is part of why they're not taking the NFC into it right now. Yeah, that's what I also was thinking too. Is that maybe maybe that's another reason? So now, actually, now that I think about it, now I know I remember how they did it. They basically created an app on their uh, smartphone or something where mm -hmm. you basically, if you're close enough, you can tap like someone's back pocket or something, get the yeah. information, and you don't even need the other person's credit card. You have the information already downloaded to the app mm -hmm. through NFC. That's mm -hmm. was the demonstration of a huge security flaw with NFC. Mm -hmm. So it must be linking to another database or something. So it's just giving you it's just giving you some information over the NFC and you can suck that up by bumping yeah. into someone yeah. and then reuse it. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Well I have all kinds of ideas how to how to break NFC, but you know. And then until Oh well <laughs> <laughs> until companies actually adopt the ability to accept NFC. You still mm. can't just use NFC solely, which means you're kinda of stuck carrying your cards anyway. The cards and the NFC is not really quite as Yeah, that's right, yeah, because a lot of places won't have it, and so then you'll have to whip out your credit card. And as lazy as we tend to be as a society, if we can't do it everywhere, we won't probably do it in most places. We treat it like a gimmick if we can't do it everywhere. Well, we'll comment on the laziness there. That's, that's a gross uh, statement there. Um, but yeah, it is inconvenient to carry a big fat wallet and a phone. Yeah, so what's the point? Hmm. Okay. That's it. Good. We got some insight on NFC here. Nice to know it's already been broken. <laughs> so that's good. So I could be sitting in here and, you know, oh, nice. Yeah. Only if you broke. Nice and tight. No, but why, why, what if I was to put a little, okay, pad over all the seats, right? Yeah, you can, yeah. yeah I could pad in that. The problem is I couldn't sell it to anybody but <laughs> someone who wants to steal NFCs. They'd like to pay more anyway. <laughs> Yeah. I know the hmm. the hmm. NFC used in like a lot of Asian countries, like they make sure there's like a cap limit as to like how much money you take out. You just don't use that to buy like you know, groceries or whatever. You use it for oh, some way. Oh, oh got it. And so I mean even if you're stealing some you're you only be taking out a dollar or two. Yeah, I see. So, okay, yeah, that would, only a dollar know, yeah, well yeah. Or still builds up fast. Yeah. <laughs> mm, man, I could be having one about 18, yeah. four bucks in this class just today here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, uh, with that, let's get back to some more um, <clears throat> pertinent topic here. Let's see.
Okay, so I want to review real quick just this idea of frame synchronization. I guess review is not the right term since we haven't done it yet, but um, it's a review for me since I did it before. Um, so now, you know, supposing that we have corrected for symbol timing. So if it's fixed, then after the downsampler, we receive this signal n minus, what am I using here? Oh. So this is the channel, which by the way, you don't know. And this is the delay, which also, by the way, you do not know. So the symbol timing, or sorry, the frame synchronization problem or frame timing problem is really to to estimate this D. And in particular, you need to estimate that D without the benefit of knowing the, the, the H. So um, with that, what we do is, so there's a couple of different ways, ways to do this here. My favorite approach is to use um, known information, which is called training information here. So suppose that Every so often, you insert n sub t known symbols in the transmission. So instead of just sending a very long sequence of binary information, we're going to send short sequences of binary information interspersed with pieces of known information here. So let's call this nt. And this is called training data here. Then there's going to be the actual data here. And then it might repeat, et cetera, here. Wow, that's a dismal picture. Somehow it looks better on my piece of paper. Uh, <laughs> it's the glasses. It magnifies it. Uh, now, th so this is just for illustration purposes. Now, in actuality, there could be some kind of a gap here. It turns out that all wireless systems are designed with some kind of a structure similar to this in mind, where there is known, you know, either binary information or known symbols that are interspersed between the unknown data. So this goes by the name of training or pilots, usually. And because you know this information, you can use this. This is what we would call side information in a communication system. So it's basically like a genie telling you, OK, here's, here's the value of this part of the data, and here's the value of this part of the data. Now you use that known information to solve for other things that you don't know. In this case, we're going to solve for the, um, the delay here. So i to think here if I can do this without doing least squares first here. Yeah, okay. All right. So we'll, we'll talk about a simpler approach, and then we'll do a more complicated approach probably Wednesday, probably next Monday here, either Wednesday or next Monday. So a simple approach would just be to correlate with the unknown, with the known training sequence here. So effectively, we would come up with some sort of a, again, discrete time cost function. Let's call it JF of, what am I using here? Shoot, I'm using D, it's the unknown delay here. Let's call that D sub F maybe, yes. I'll put this as D here. And then I will look at the correlation between my training data, and I'm going to call my training data sequence T of K, from K equals 0 to NT minus 1. 
So I'm basically just going to slide through with my training data and correlate and look for the place where I get a peak. So I'm going to multiply through by the conjugate, because it's complex, T of K. And in this case here, I'm going to keep the I'm going to keep the training fixed. I'm going to slide the data, slide the data through it here. And so then in here, I'm going to write y of n plus k. And then I'm going to look for the value of the peak there. And so then find, let's say, so d hat is going to be equal to the arg max jf of d. So effectively, um, we're going to look for the peak. And then notice here that because this channel here, even though it's unknown, it's constant, it's always going to be multiplying whatever you have here. That this works irrespectively of you know the H or not. So this is really just dependent on the correlation between the T and the signal sequence S here. So that's essentially this, this idea of frame synchronization. Um, the final point I'll mention here, let's see, I want to talk about the correlation properties of the sequence. I guess I'll, I'll give special examples of that next time here. So let me just make a note here that you know special sequence properties can improve performance. So there are special sequences that have good correlation properties. And you know, mathematicians and other people have tabulated such sequences. And they are known for different, for binary, for different symbol alphabets. Um, I'll give you a good example of a sequence that really is terrible, the all one sequence. That doesn't correlate well, but, right? Think about all ones correlating with itself. You get a big, fat peak. What you want are sequences that, when correlated together, give you a very sharp peak. And, and so such sequences are known. And we'll talk a little bit more about the sequences here. But essentially, I wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of the frame synchronization. And where the frame synchronization is going to go is we're going to have our C to D operating at T over M. We're going to have our match filter, our symbol sync, downsampling by M, and then our frame sync will go over here. So we'll have a Z to the, if I've done this correctly here, Z to the D hat, and then a frame sync block operating right here. And putting that there with the remainder of this to be filled in in the subsequent lecture here. Okay, so any questions about frame synchronization? I mean, I think the main thing here is to know, you know, what is frame synchronization? And this is one possible way of solving for the offset. But we're going to... Um, put together a more robust solution in, in a few lectures from now. So this is basically just a, a very simple approach here, intuitive approach. So any questions about this here? All right. So then we will move on to the last phase of the lecture today which has to do with least squares. So this is probably what seems like a complete diversion, um, but it will actually be useful here. And so ideally, you've actually seen this before um, in a linear algebra class, but um, you know, I don't, don't know for sure, so I'm going to cover at least the concept again. So the motivation for this is that um, like over in the frame synchronization problem, we formulated a cost function, and we solved it here. In this case, over some d. 
And this kind of made sense because we could search over possible finite sets of these are integers. So you can just check all the possible ones in the range of interest and see if it works here. For general estimation problems, we need another mathematical approach that will let us um, estimate the unknown parameters given this training information. And there's different ways to do it. So in the class, we're going to use primarily what's called the least squares estimator. And least squares is, is actually a very deep mathematical principle here. So it starts off with um, a set of linear equations, ax equals b here. So A is going to be an n by m matrix. X is going to be m by 1 vector. B is going to be n by 1 here. And so in this typical linear algebra problem, X is unknown, A is known, and B is known here. And so hopefully you've seen the case that you know if n is equal to m, and you have this AX equals B, x is unknown, then the solution is x is equal to a inverse b, assuming that a is invertible. So if you can formulate such a problem, then you can solve it very easily just using you know, the inverse here. Now suppose that we have the following setup here. So suppose that n is greater than m and that a is full rank. What a being full rank means is that, um, so first of all, we say that a, n greater than m, we say that a is tall. What if n is less than m? Does anyone know what we call the matrix? Yeah, we call it wide or fat. It's not short for some reason. <laughs> yeah. So in this case, a is tall here. And so full rank means that um, all the columns of a are linearly independent. Um, I mean, there, there's various ways to express that. But the simplest way that I can think of here is it means that, you know, the columns are linearly independent. <clears throat> and effectively, this means that if you try to solve the equation ax equals 0, then the only solution is x equals 0. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, now look at the solution of this problem where A is tall. And so this value of N, N is going to be what we call the number of observations. So B is of length N by 1. So B is, you can think about B as being the vector of observations. And M... So I'll put that here, length of B. And this is going to be the number of unknowns. Length of X here. OK, so now let's look at um, this quantity here, AX. So one way to think about the product of AX is let's write the vectors that correspond to the rows of A as A1, A2, through A of M here. And I'm going to rewrite X in terms of its coefficients through X of M here. So what you can see here is that this is a, this is a, you think about this as a product between, you know, this set of vectors here, the scalars. So this is just the sum from m equals 1 to m, a to m of x, m here. So a being fixed, so effectively what we're doing is we're taking a linear combination of the columns of a. And we want this to be equal to b.
Now, the problem is that um, your phone's on, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> this is good. I can check if the lecture is boring because you start to check your, your email and the phone. <laughs> yes, exactly. I just got a whole bunch of information, too, from that. <laughs> Only a dollar. So here's a problem here that we have m unknowns, but we have more than n. We have m unknowns, but n observations here. So generally speaking, if n is greater than m, the exact solution not possible is not possible. In general. Now, of course, there are special cases where your desired sigma b is a linear combination of the a's. You know, and you can construct examples. But in our, um, the estimation problems we're trying to solve, that turns out that that's very rare. So we don't need to, to consider that here. So what we're going to do is we're going to then say, well, if we can't get ax equals b, let's find an, an x that's close. So let the squared error be the norm of E squared, where the error is the difference between AX and B here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the least square solution, which I'm going to call XLS, and I'm going to find the argmin of AX minus B <coughs> squared, which I'll call J of X for short here. So the least squares problem is essentially just the solution to minimizing the squared value between AX and B. So that's all it is here. Now, to go through here and solve this problem, I'm going to make use of a couple results from um, essentially matrix calculus. Um, so these are summarized in the book here. But this is the extent of matrix calculus that you need to know. So in reverse, I'll rewrite the cost function as a quadratic form because dealing with that norm is a pain. So I'm going to write this as ax minus b conjugate. And so remember, my conjugate is, is Hermitian. It's conjugate transpose. This is commonly used in um, books on matrix theory like Horn and Johnson, for example. Although sometimes engineers use h, but I, I personally like the star there. OK, so what we do first here is we just expand this out. So we just multiply through each product. And remember, this is conjugate transpose. We flip stuff on the other side. So this is just AX star AX minus B star AX minus X star A star B plus B star B. OK, so that's just multiplying that through here. Now. What we need to do is we need to differentiate this with respect to, now typically in complex analysis, when you're differentiating a function of a complex, a real function of a complex variable, you differentiate with respect to the conjugate. And there's some theory behind that here. So we're actually going to differentiate with respect to, yeah, here it should be, well, differentiate with respect to the conjugate transpose, OK. Differentiate this quantity here. and. What it turns out that I get, and this is just a re simple result from matrix calculus here. So you may, may have seen this, may not. But essentially, the derivative of x star a star ax gives us a star ax. The derivative of b star ax actually is 0. Because when you take this, der take this derivative, you treat, if the function is analytic, you treat x and x star as being independent variables. So that's 0. Derivative of this becomes a star b. The derivative of that is independent of x is 0. And so then we set this equal to 0. And this leads to a star a x equals a star b. And believe it or not, this has a name, this equation here. It's called the normal equations. Equation or equations, because there's multiple variables here, so. So minimizing the, um, the squared error has led us to 
solving a different problem. Now here, let's look at the dimensions. This right here is m by m. This is m by 1. And this vector here, product, is m by 1. So now we have what looks like potentially the setting as before, where everything here is square. Now it turns out that the full rank assumption implies that a star a is invertible. Therefore, the least square solution can be written as a star a inverse a b. Yeah, a star b here. So that's the least squares solution. This is also known right here as the pseudo inverse of a. More printer of the pseudo inverse here. Now, we'll also need this following fact here, which is how good did we do? Let's plug in this at, into XLS. So if I plug in A XLS minus B squared, so this is the resu residual squared error. Then I get A A star A inverse A star B minus B. times conjugate times a, a star a inverse a star b minus b, which you can show that is equal to, let me see here, if I factor this out here, I don't have time to show exactly the results here, but um, it falls from this calculus that we just did here, from the, what's called the orthogonality equation. But essentially that this is equal to A, A star A, inverse A star minus identity times B, norm squared here. And this quantity here actually is a special kind of a matrix is called a projection matrix. And it's a specific kind of a projection that projects onto the orthogonal of the space spanned by the columns of A here. And then let me just wrap this up here with a, with a picture of like basically what all of this means here. So, yeah, sorry, actually I should have simplified. All right, so I'll skip that then. So basically, this is like the classic picture you see anywhere here. So if I have the space here, this is the space of all linear combinations of A right here. And this is my vector B, which doesn't necessarily live in that space. So what I do to find A XLS is I project B down and find the vector such that this point here is as close as possible to that B, right? So if you go anywhere on the plane here, this point right here, which is right underneath where this is a um, A, this is going to be the closest possible value here. And so if you look, A XLS is equal to A, A star A inverse A star B. And this is, this is that projection operation. And this right here is the smallest error. So effectively, what we're going to do with least squares, and then the smallest error has length, you know, of what I just showed here. So effectively, what we're doing with least squares here is we're finding the point that is as close as possible to this B here. But we're constraining it to live in a plane that's linear combinations of the columns of A. Now where all of this will come into communications, we're going to see on Wednesday, where effectively B is going to be our observed values. 
and A is going to be some function of training data. And so we're going to use this least squares to solve for estimates of the channel. We're going to use it to do frame synchronization. We're going to use it to do joint channel estimation, frame synchronization. We're also going to use it for um, several other estimation type problems. So anyway, so we'll, so we'll see this several times here. But this is a mathematical theory. And the basic thing you need to know is the form of the least square solution that has to be full rank. You know, these are the normal equations. And then be able to, to draw this picture right here. Oh, man. All right. Hold on here. All right, again, I forgot to put my uh, little least, least squares sheet up here. Shoot. All right. Find and compute the least square solution. I'm going to like edit the video and cut these back in here. Frame synchronization. Formulate the problem of frame synchronization. Solve a frame synchronization problem using energy detector or a correlator. And then the symbol synchronization was formulating this synchronization problem and solving the maximum output energy using either the both the d derivative in the continuous time as well as the direct form. All right, that's it. I'm sorry I took up two, three extra minutes here. You can turn the video off.